Part two, chapter five, exploring Kathmandu. Harper left her family in St. Louis on April 3rd, and now, April 7th, she was getting into the flow. Four members of the Mount Everest guide team met for lunch before heading out to get their SIM cards for their phone and buy a few last minute items. The others arrived later that night. They had a simple dinner, went to bed early, trying to shake off jet lag. Mark looked at the caller ID on his iPhone, 977-980-808-0345. Hmm, a 13 digit number must mean only one thing. Harper is calling from Nepal. Hello, he said with anticipation. Hey, honey, it's me. She said with gratitude from a working connection. So good to hear your voice. We miss you. I miss you so much, he said in a deep sense of reflection. How are you? How's Catman do? Have you seen a yak? He asked, teasing her like he always does. With her iPhone now using an in-cell mobile card, Harper could call home for about two pennies a minute. She spoke with her husband and kids for only an hour for only $12. She hoped the Wi-Fi from Everest Link would work that all the way up to base camp and throughout the expedition. It was her lifeline to home. Can you put the kids on? Harper asked, fishing them terribly. Mom, Olivia and Jay said in unison. Is it different than here? Do they speak English? How's the food? Tell us everything. The 12 and 14 year olds were overjoyed hearing their mother's voice. Mom, guess what? I did a speech day at school about your climbing Mount Everest. Everyone was so impressed, but some said it was dangerous and people die. I told them that you told us about being careful, training hard, and being with the best guides. I told them I wasn't afraid that I was proud of you. Olivia streamed without breathing. Tears welled up in her face. Thank you, honey. I'm proud of you also. They hung up promising to talk again before she left Kathmandu. Maybe a video chat next time. With her first day checklist complete, Harper crawled into bed and went to sleep immediately. The alarm on her altitude watch went off at 7 the next morning. She thought she had gone to sleep and felt rested, but she really didn't feel that great. She took a quick shower, ignoring her hair, letting it air dry in the Kathmandu warm air, even though she had lived on the border between the Midwest and the American South, where Oregon roots were strong. Dressed in jeans and a Patagonia t-shirt, she joined the group for breakfast. The hotel had an excellent breakfast with scrambled eggs, bacon, all sorts of jam, toast, tea, and Nescafe coffee. Harper loved coffee, but this, this was not the coffee that she had in mind. But overall, the breakfast was simple and tasty. She loaded her plate with not too much food while looking around the room for Dutch or the couple. Maybe they were there. Not finding them, she went outside to the covered patio. There she found her group along with the new members. All but one, one person were engaged in a getting-to-know-you conversation. Of course, Dava was right in the middle, flashing his Everest smile and laughing easily. There was a relaxed feeling to the group. The talk flowed smoothly, as did the laughs. Harper immediately had a good feeling, but noted Tony sat alone at the end of the table, not engaged in the conversation. He had a distant look in his eyes. A 50-person bus pulled up outside the hotel to take him on a tour of Kathmandu. A trip around the city is often included with an Everest climb and helps introduce Nepal climbers to their culture. Her group of seven climbers plus three trekkers and the ever-present Dawa and a tour guide hopped on the bus. There were more than enough seats for everyone to spread out. The coach lumbered off to the, visit the usual temples and stupas. The first stop was to the Pashadipta temple, where both Hindus and Buddhists take their dead for cremation ceremonies. Everything was out in the public. The families were accustomed to having tourists and locals watching, complete with camera in hand. Harper learned that if her mother died, the youngest son led the ceremony. If the father, then the oldest son takes charge. The total cost was somewhere around $40 to $60, a lot of money for the, many of these families. They believe that those who die in the temple are reborn as human, regardless of any misconduct that could have worsened their karma. Families try to cremate their loved one within 24 hours of death. The body is lovingly cleaned, sometimes painted before wrapped in a white cloth and gently laid on a pyre of wood. The sun then takes a flaming torch, circles the body many times, and sets the prior aflame. The ceremony often takes about three hours, spreading the ashes into the Bagmiti River, which eventually joins the Ganges in India. Seeing men painted in bright colors, often wearing a loincloth, was intriguing to Harper. Thus, sadhus wearing, the sadhus wearing wandering ecstatic yogis posed for pictures of the temple area, asking for a small donation in return. The tour guide said they were trying to acquire liberation from the cycle of death and rebirth through meditation. 
Harper asked Dutch to take a picture of her with one of them. My honor, he stately replied with the wind blowing his long hair over his face. Their next stop was one of the largest stupas in Southeast Asia, Budanath. It, had, it had, It's been a year, it had become the focal point for the Tibetan Buddhism in Nepal. With April 14th, 2024, the start of the Nepal New Year, around the corner, the temple was full of families praying for their dead in the past year. They circled all three levels of stupa, prayer wheels encased in lower wall made for more crowds and more people, local and tourists alike, circled the base, spinning each wheel with passion. Harper looked at the stupa with admiration. The 2015 earthquake damaged the stupa, but we never know it now. She looked in the eyes of Buddha and remembered the saying, Buddha is always watching. Hmm. Somehow she found that comforting. The air was full of smoke and incense, along with the sound of praying monks, clanging bells, the announcements over a loudspeaker, all competing for sensory overload. She observed that object poverty and many disabled people begging for money. The last stop was what was called the Monkey Temple. Dutch was especially interested in getting a good photo of one of the 500 wild monkeys crawling around the steps in the buildings. Harper noted that Tony ignored the monkeys, but was keen on getting a workout by climbing the 365 well-worn steps leading to the top of the temple as fast as he could. On the bus ride back, Harper sat across the aisle from Tony. Pretty good workout at the temple, huh? Harper said in a friendly voice. Yes, he replied, looking out the window, sweat beating down his forehead. Dutch, Claudia, and Pablo were laughing as they re reviewed his monkey pictures. The other team members and trekkers quietly talked among themselves, except for the older gentleman, Jim. He was fast asleep. Harper settled back into her bus seat, taking inventory of the team now at five. Two of the climbers were still trekking, and they would meet at Everest Base Camp. And one other should have arrived while they had been touring. Their sole Western guide, John Paul, had not yet joined them. He was busy getting their climbing permits and sorting out other details. He'd meet them for dinner later that night. Harper reflected on what she had seen that day. It was different from anything she had seen back home. Cremations, chanting, prayer wheels, flags, the people's intensity and devotion. The respect and the love during the goodbye to a loved one was inspiring to her. She was already letting the experience seep into her essence, open to learning, open to change. Back home, it was all about work and family. A year ago, Harper had begun to take more time for herself. This climb was a milestone in that journey. She was eager to see what would come next. They returned to the hotel to do their final packing, planning to leave for Lukla early the next morning if the low weather allowed flying to the Alpine Strip. Tonight, the team would have their first dinner together. Harper was a bit anxious seeing the different personalities during the day. She began the process of, the process of sorting the group. Above all, she wanted a positive experience. Chapter six, the first team dinner. Be in the lobby at six, we'll walk to dinner, Dawa said to the team as they headed back to their rooms after a day in Kathmandu. Harper felt good, invigorated by the day's experience. She was happy to have met more of her teammates, anxious to meet the Western guide, Jean Paul. He had a reputation and she was curious to meet him in person. Entering his room, number 303, Dutch saw his roommate had arrived. Two bags sat next to his duffels, but it was a sound that caused attention. On my God, he said aloud. It was a snore of all snores emanating from the blanket underneath the bed next to his. It was grinding, piercing, thundering, and a bit scary. Dutch stood at the end of the bed staring. A full-grown man with one leg half hanging off the bed and the other under the sheet. His arms were stretched way over his head, his bare chest heaving with each eruption. With a snort and a honk, he jerked to life, sitting up straight, eyes wide open, staring at Dutch from the end of his bed. Hello, Dutch volunteered, trying to manage the moment. Oh, uh, yes, hello, mate, Michael said, trying to maintain a semblance of dignity. Just get in, Dutch began the conversation. Yeah, the flight was late, as it always is from Oz. I had to wait for my bags and a ride. You know the drill. Been through this enough, you'd think I wouldn't be surprised anymore. But this is Nepal, after all he said with a wide yawn that revealed multiple cavities filled with silver in his mouth. Well, we meet downstairs at six. I'm going to take a shower. Maybe the last one I'll get for weeks, Dutch, Dutch said as he went into the bathroom. Turning on the water, he heard the freight train resume his journey, or maybe it was a steam train. 
One by one, the team walked down the stairs and into the hotel lobby. Most were wearing hiking shoes, some sneakers, other simple sandals. Over here, an authoritative voice announced. They gathered around a tall young man, perhaps 30. He was lean, almost gaunt, but his arms had muscles. Not huge ones, but well-defined. His waist was slim. One looks at he was a climber. From Mount Everest guides, welcome everyone. With Dawa and the rest of the staff's help, everyone, and I mean everyone, will be standing on the top of the Big E on May 20th, only six weeks from now. But for now, let's go eat. And with that, John Paul moved towards the door. Walking down the street, Harper caught up with the young couple who were walking hand in hand. She liked them, especially felt close to Claudia, who was, he, who was like a grown-up version of her daughter, Olivia. Pablo was on the street side of Claudia, remembering that his father had taught him always have the woman on the inside and you on the outside. He was all about manners. But Claudia didn't need any protection. Claudia was the stronger of the two, as Harper would soon find out. Harper looked healthy and fit. It was apparent that her training had paid off. The two women began to talk about home, family, training, and dreams. My mother always had been a central figure in our life. She lives with us, Harper volunteered. They walked down the dirty streets of Tamel to a restaurant. It had an excellent reputation, and from now on, Mount Everest guys was footing the bill except for drinks. Inside the Roadhouse Cafe, they set up three tables pulled together quickly by the staff. Harper counted the people at the table. John Paul, three trekkers, seven Everest climbers, and of course, Dawa. Hmm, two are missing, Harper thought. If you wondered where the rest of the team are, they left a few days ago to trek to base camp by way of Gokio. They'll meet us at Everest Base Camp, John Paul offered to the group. Harper liked that he anticipated the question and volunteered an answer. Hmm, always a good first impression. Dutch and Michael sat next to Dawa and immediately drilling him with question. What's the route look like in the icefall this year? How many teams? Was there a lot of snow this winter? What do you think the conditions would be like on the mountain? Dawa patiently addressed each one as his pizza arrived. John Paul sandwiched between Tony and Jim, the oldest member of the team who looked very tired. So let's go around the table and hear a bit about everyone. Keep it short, plenty of time to get to know each other over the next six weeks. How about you first? Each one spoke for a few minutes, some a bit longer. Michael cleared his throat and began. <clears throat> first, I can't help it, but I snore. I snore louder if I drink. Anyway, this is my fourth trip to Nepal. Climbed Island Peak in 2012, then Mira and Lobache in 15. Got Manislu. You know, it's Nate Ausner. I got that in 18. Would have gotten more but hard to get away from my law practice back in Atlanta. Anyway, love Nepal and these climbing Sherpas. Can't do it without them. Okay, we'll go next. Claudia took a sip of beer before continuing. Pablo and I are from Quito, as you might guess from our accents. We've been a couple for six years now and have climbed everything together. Pablo quickly interrupted. Claudia's a stronger climber than me. She's got Denali, but I had to turn back at high camp. Claudia jumped back in. We summited Aconcagua together in January, but it's been a tough to get time off for work and save money at the same time. But we're here, and it's our first time to Nepal. Harper listened intently to their introductions. For the climbs on Kilimanjaro, Denali, and Aconcagua, Harper felt prepared, but it bothered her that she had not been to 8,000 meters. She wondered how her body would perform at that extreme altitude. I'm married. I have a 12 and a 14-year-old back home, and Everest has been a lifelong dream. Harper kept her introduction short as Harper could sense John Paul was getting a bit anxious with all the talk. How about you, John Paul leaned over to Jim. Well, not much to say other than this is my last chance. I tried last year and made it to Camp 3 before I got sick. Got tired, gave up. Hell, to be honest, I'm not sure what happened. But I thought I had the time and the money, and, this is, and there's really no one at home, so why the hell not give it one more try? His voice trailed off as he took a bite of his giant cheeseburger. They all sat quietly for a minute, eating their pizzas, hamburgers, pasta, enjoying the quality of the food in a casual atmosphere. Everything tastes good? The young waiter asked with a pleasant smile. Yes, thank you, Dava said. Seeing an opportunity to jump in, Dutch grabbed the stage. Standing up, he started. First, it's an honor to be here with everyone. I'm sure you are as excited as I am to be attempting Mount Everest. And I'm sure Dava and his team's excellent help will make it all... Be safe, and we'll all return home with all of our digits and important parts. Harper smiled at his formality. He was quirky, but also endearing. Harper noticed that Tony had gone to the toilet a few minutes earlier and never came back. Okay, team, we got an early start tomorrow. A simple breakfast in the lobby at 3.30 a.m. sharp. The van will leave with all our bags at 4. 
Make sure you have one duffel pack to go straight to base camp and the other will be carried by porters for the whole trek to base camp. I suggest asking for a wake up call. Please, please don't be late. Harper walked back at a quicker pace than the rest. She wanted to FaceTime with her kids before flying to Lukla. A calm embraced her as she let the moment sink in. Yes, Harper was in Kathmandu and on her way to climb Mount Everest. Chapter 7, Lukla Drama. Known as one of the world's most dangerous airports, flying into Lukla is a time of high anxiety. There had been seven crashes since 2000, killing over 50 passengers and crew. However, to keep these tragedies in perspective, there are thousands of passengers that fly safely each year between Lukla and Kathmandu. There are several challenges flying in and out of Lukla. First, there's only one runway, and it sits on top of a 2,000-foot cliff and ends where a mountain wall begins. There's no opportunity for a missed landing or an equipment failure. There's no radar, no electronic landing assistance, so pilots are strictly on VFR, or visual flight rules, which simply means they must talk amongst themselves during landing and takeoff and have li limited assistance from any form of air traffic control. The second challenge at Luca is the weather. It sits at 9,400 feet surrounded by the low peaks of the Himalayan mountain range. The airport is often shrouded in low clouds, rain, and snow, shutting it down and shutting down visibility. And that's an issue in a visual environment. The third is the short runway. At the Tenzing Hillary Airport, the formal name, the runway is short, only 1,510 feet long and 66 feet wide at a 12% slope. Compared to Heathrow, where a runway is 12,801 feet by 164 feet, much, much long, much shorter. It takes a special kind of aircraft to land and take off in such a short area. Known as a short takeoff and landing, or STOL, planes, the fleet of Twin Otters, Dorniers, flown by Yeti Airlines or Sita Air, fly climbers and trekkers for about $150 one way from Kathmandu. Her eyes wide open as the clock ticked to 3 a.m. Nervous energy was working hard to prepare her for one of the milestones of any Everest expedition, a flight to Lukla. Harper thought about the decades ago when people would make the trek from Kathmandu to Jiri, or on to Lukla, or maybe Namchi, about a 100-mile walk taking over 10 days. But today, climbers and trekkers use helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft to get there. Harper had packed her duffels late last night after another check-in with her kids and Mark over FaceTime. She really missed them. She lingered in the shower, enjoying the hot water, albeit low pressure, but she was grateful for knowing the showers at base camp were a rare luxury. Good morning, my queen, Dutch greeted her as she came down the stairs, lugging one of her bags. Let me help you with that. He grabbed the bag and parked it next to the pile. It was amazing how much gear it took to climb mountains, but the real stash was already at base camp, carried up by porters and yaks. The climbing Sherpas had been at Everest Base Camp for over two weeks, preparing tent platforms, setting up various tents, and making the camp as comfortable as possible for their members. They did so much work behind the scenes that was invisible to the members. John Paul was prepared. He looked like he had just left from a photo shoot. Not a hair out of place, shaved, wrinkle-free shirt. How does he do that? Michael whispered to Jim. Hell if I know. I'm lucky I woke up this morning, he grumbled back. They piled into two vans with their gear for the ride to the domestic terminal at the airport. Everyone was quiet, either nervous or still waking up. The roads were also quiet, only a few dogs rummaging through the garbage left in the streets. No cows this time. Dawa and a few others grabbed luggage carts and everyone pitched in the transfer bags to the check-in at the Yeti counter. Each bag was weighed on a huge scale. The scale's long arms swung over with each bag. 27 kilos, that's okay, said a young man working fast. The schedule was critical because Luca has poor weather and flights are regularly turned back, even after they've left Kathmandu when low visibility shuts down the airport. Okay, now we weigh each of you, he called out to the group. What? We have to get on the scale? Michael moaned. He was slightly embarrassed about his weight waistline. He stepped as lightly as possible on the metal platform, watching the arms swing hard and fast to the right. When it stopped, he hopped off quickly, hoping no one would see the number. Security consisted of a man in a military uniform going through the handbags, primarily looking for matches, lighters, and batteries. Once cleared, they all assembled in the waiting room to start the time-honored ceremony of flight watch. The monitor showed Kathmandu to Luklo, YT-145 leaving at 725. 
they sat down. Claudia and Pablo appeared to have a small tray with coffee cups. They had brought one for each person. Nice touch, Harper thought, taking advantage of the airport's Wi-Fi. Soon everyone became immersed in texting, posting, or surfing. While they were counting on the Wi-Fi throughout the expedition, they knew better not to assume that it would always be available. To no one's surprise, the monitor updated the flight status. Now it would leave at 8 o'clock. The slow creep of delays had begun. Okay, everyone, let's go. The plane will leave at 7.15. John Paul yelled to the group from the door. Exchanging glances of shock, they scrambled to finish their sink of coffee and grab their backpacks. Back on the same bus, they drove them to the terminal when they arrived. This, this ride was a bit longer, taking them by the Nepali military area. One massive chopper stood out, a decades-old rotor machine. It's often used to carry tons of gear as high as possible, offloading the yaks and the porters from the heavier cargo. Think this thing is safe? Pablo asked Tony. He shrugged. They gave their pack to a man who put them in a small section in the back of the plane and crawled in up five steps and into the single aisle airplane. The Twin Otter had three seats across and six rows. The Mount Everest Guides team took, the, uh, took up the entire plane. Now, five hours after her wake-up call, Harper settled into her seat, smaller than a fourth-grade school desk. The flight attendant came by offering a single piece of hard candy and, curiously, a wad of cotton. Harper looked at the cotton confused. The pleasant flight attendant pointed to her ear. Oh, for the noise, Harper said, nodding to the nodding young woman. It all made sense as a twin prop engine started up, a tremendous whine and a roar. Just as the sun rose, the twin otter STOL aircraft took off. The flight to Lukla was short, 30 minutes. For once, she wished it was longer. Leaving the Kathmandu Valley, Harper had a perfect view of the rolling terrain in Nepal. She marveled at how crop fields were carved out of the steep hillsides, homes and roads built on mountain ridges. She thought about the resilience of the people. The plane jerked as it flew over a thunderstorm. The props squealed as it fought for power in the thin air. Harper instinctively tugged her seatbelt and she glanced over at Dawa. <laughs> he was asleep. Looking to the cockpit for reassurance, Harper saw that one, the pilot had his hand on the yoke. Both pilots had their hand on the throttle, standard procedure, but still, her heart raced nonetheless. In her mind, she knew these pilots had made this flight hundreds of times, but her anxiety heightened. Harper thought of her kids. The whine of the ten engines was, twin engines were deafening. Harper pushed the cotton wad a bit deeper. Then in a blink, the otter's wheels gently touched down the runway. The engine roared as the props reversed. She glanced out the window to see a blur of motion. Will we stop in time? She lunged forward as the brakes brought the small aircraft to a halt. Everyone applauded. Sense of relief was spontaneity and involuntary. Welcome to Lukla, called out John Paul. Dawa just smiled. Okay, everyone, grab your bag and follow Dawa. We'll, be, we'll go over one by one to one of the tea houses for a proper breakfast, and then we'll start the trek to Pakding.